All right. Enjoy the rest of service. <laughs> it will be enjoyable. How's everyone doing? Good morning. It's good to, uh, good to see you all. We're going to have a good uh, morning today. I, I want to let you know our Cambodia team got home kind of in the middle of the night, and uh, everyone's safe. Uh, they had a fantastic trip. Um, you'll hear more about it next week, but uh, right now they're trying to figure out what time zone they're in. Uh, they've been being 14 hours ahead is just about being completely uh, flipped upside down, so it takes a little while to get all straightened out. I'm sure Pastor Tim will mention things um, next week. So I wanted to ask you, um, I, w I wanted to ask you how salty you've been this week. Uh, if you weren't here last week, we had a message out of Matthew chapter 5 dealing with uh, when Jesus calls his disciples to be salt and light. And if you weren't here, I'd encourage you to go and, and watch that and it will actually tie in with what we're uh, doing today. But I, but I did wonder, it's like, were there opportunities that you had to flavor situations around you this week? Did, were there places that you had that you could be a light, shine a light of, uh, of maybe protection or hope or direction or guidance or, or something for uh, people's safety uh, in, in the midst of that? Um, we, we looked at how Matthew 5 was kind of the beginning of the three chapter long uh, Sermon on the Mount and in Jesus just just sharing with his disciples saying, hey, there's a whole different way to, uh, to live, a whole different way to think about life. And he called us something. He, he elevated his disciples. If we're disciples, this works for us too. But he elevated us saying, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And so, uh, so we've got to live like that. But there's a problem that we run into with that. And that's what I want to talk about today because we come to this place, I want to call this message, Whose Opinion? And we come to this place sometimes where we're not sure when we're called to be salt and light, we're not sure whose opinion we're supposed to listen to uh, because oftentimes we will have opinions of ourselves or others. And so I just want to kind of talk through that uh, topic. And we're going to look at several areas of Scripture in a little bit. In fact, if you do, have your Bible along or you want to follow along on your phone, this would be great to mark some things, but, uh, but we're going to go through several different uh, places in Scripture in just a little bit. First, I want to kind of talk about um, why I think this is important. People talk about the optics of the situation. Uh, optics is actually a scientific term, but we're not going to talk about it from the scientific perspective. We're going to talk about a social definition of the word optics, and that social definition is pretty much unique to North, North America. It doesn't exist quite the same in, uh, in all of the world, um, but it, it has to do with this. Optics is something, uh, it's the way in which an event or course of action is perceived by the public. So in other words, somebody may choose to do something and however you perceive what they're doing is the optics of it. It may be different than what they perceive to do. So, for example, optics is what people think they see or it's what people believe in their heart that they see, or it's what people think what they see is saying, okay? Or it's what they see is impacting how they think about something. So these are all part of optics, and those things may be totally different than what's intended. So somebody may do something or say something, and they had one intention of what they wanted that to do, and other people have a completely different perspective of it. And they start to attribute motives to that and start to uh, determine what, what they actually think was being said. And it may have been completely different. You know, you may have just been trying to say something nice to someone, like, hey, you look nice today. And they completely misconstrued what you're saying. You get the point of what I'm talking about? Some of you do? Yeah, okay, we're, we're getting there. So... There are optics we live in in situations. There are optics we live in um, in how we view others or how we view situations or how we even view ourselves. And we may start to believe something that is completely untrue about a situation because of, of optics that are incorrect. Social media. Anybody ever heard of the term FOMO? 
Yeah, FOMO is true in our nation. Fear of missing out. It's what happens when you see the incredible things someone else is doing and you're afraid that you're going to miss out on that. I have to tell you, I'm glad that when I was a teenager, I, couldn't, I didn't know what other friends of mine were doing so that I didn't feel like I was left out because I was left out. I mean, that's, that's the way I, I grew up and I had other things that were responsibilities that I had to do and there were lots of things that I didn't get to go to or get, didn't get to do because of responsibilities. And Had I been able to go home from, from work at 16 years old and sit there and scroll and go, oh man, they were at a party, they were at a baseball game, they ate that, you know, they did this. Uh, that, that's one of those areas where optics begins to uh, affect us. Or... Oftentimes, we start to attribute motives to things that people do. In other words, you did this because you were saying such and such. You ever had that happen to you? Somebody accuses you of something, of, of, uh, challenges your motive when it wasn't your motive at all. I was trying to do something totally different than that. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, we sometimes will repeat things we've heard until it becomes a reality in a situation and we start to believe things that aren't uh, true. If a child hears long enough, if they hear someone say, you will never amount to anything, you know what happens to that child? They will never amount to anything unless something comes in and breaks that pattern and sets them free from the incorrect pattern of belief. And there's too many times that there's negative words spoken over people in situations and people start to believe those things even though they're not true. Uh, the same can be true with yourself. You may tell yourself that you're going to never amount to anything. And you know what's going to happen? You will never amount to anything unless something comes and breaks that pattern and you start to believe other than that lie that you've been being told. But the converse of this is true also. We have the ability to step in and speak life into situations and start reshaping negative thinking that may have happened from your past. So in other words, oftentimes people say, I will never amount to anything because of this type of thing that I've walked through or, or, or pastor, you don't know what I've done or, or this has gone on inside of me. But you and I have the ability to step in and speak life because once Jesus has delivered a person, they no longer are bound to what their past was. And we live sometimes looking at ourselves back here rather than what Jesus looks at us as being today and what he's done in us. We need to start seeing ourselves the way God sees us, the way God believes in us. In too many places we gain the incorrect view of who God's made us to be and we end up limiting the things that God may do in us or through us or with us. And as a result, we can't become the salt and light he intends us to be. We can't do the things that he, he wants. Too many places we listen to the wrong voices or the wrong people's opinions or we place value, worth, as Pastor Krista mentioned, in the wrong things that are being said. And, and the Lord thinks of you very, very differently. The enemy is always trying to minimize your spiritual efficacy. He's always trying to make it to the place that you are um, impotent to create life in the midst of the situations you're walking through. And the Lord wants to, to have you view yourself totally different because God thinks you're pretty special. Tell somebody next to you, God thinks you're pretty special. You know, the Word of God says that. The Word of God says in 2 Corinthians 5 that through Christ we're made into new creations. Isaiah 53, 5 says um, that he's healed our scars. Psalm 18, 32 says he gives us strength. 1 John 2, 12 says we're forgiven through Jesus. Ephesians 1, 5 says we have been adopted into his family. And the list goes on. And you are special to God. Each one of us are special to God. And even if you're sitting here right now saying, Pastor Doug, I don't see how that can be. I don't th see how God can see me as special. I want you to know, he does. And the more you, you allow yourself to think, no, he doesn't think I'm special, we're missing what God wants to do in us and, uh, and, and, and through us. We aren't, we aren't here today just to come and sit and fill a seat. We're here today to have an encounter with Jesus. 
And we're not only here just so we have an encounter with Jesus, we're here so that we can be shaped to help others have an encounter with Jesus. That's what our life is, is about. But if we don't see ourselves the way God sees us, then we'll never have the power, we'll never have the authority to step into any of the influential roles that he wants us to live in where we can be salt and light in the middle of the world today. So I want to look at a couple places from Scripture that uh, show this kind of situation happening and tell us a story today. And, uh, but we're going to look at a couple of longer passages of Scripture. So if you want to get your phone or Bible ready, uh, we'll also have this on the screen, but in case you want to mark it for later, we're going to go to Numbers 13 first because we have the story of Moses sending 12 spies to the Promised Land. And um, they were sent to assess the territory. And I'm going to give you an assignment. As I read through this, I'd, I'd like to ask you to look for what you think is going wrong. Where is it that this whole situation goes wrong? So here we go. The Lord now said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I'm giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out 12 men and tribal leaders of Israel uh, from their camp into the wilderness of Paran. Uh, Moses gave these men instructions. He sent them out to explore the land. He said, go north to the Negev, into the hill country. See what the land is like. Find out whether the people living there are strong or whether they're weak, whether they're few or whether they're many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good land or bad? Do their towns have walls? Are they unprotected like camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? And by the way, do your best to bring back some of the crops that you see. So they went up and they explored the land. And after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned. This is what their report was to Moses. Hey, we entered the land you sent us to explore, and it's indeed a bountiful country. We, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces, and they had brought fruit back. But the people living there, they're powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. He said, let's go up at once and we'll take the land. He said, we can certainly conquer it. But the other men who'd explored the land uh, with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. We even saw giants in the land, the descendants of Anak. They said that twice, by the way. Uh, Next to them, we feel like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. So Moses gave them instructions. And the instructions were to assess the land. He wanted to know what the resources were like in the land, what the people were like. Nowhere in the conversation does Moses ask them if it's possible for them to take the land. They were not there to do some kind of uh, of, of military recon on the land. They were there to see what everything is going on, see what the land is like, come back, show the produce, and let everybody know uh, what, was, what the place was. But they limited themselves. They decided that they were too small to accomplish this goal. They eliminated God from the picture. In other words, they forgot that God was on their side. Only Caleb and Joshua, actually, were two of the 12 spies that said, we can do this, and the others convinced everybody and said, no, we can't. The Israelite spies limited their ability or their willingness to let God show his power because they had a view of themselves based completely on human perspective. It took God completely out of the picture. We sometimes can forget about the fact that God is on our side. We sometimes try to do things in our human efforts when what we really need to do is stop and say, Lord, help me as I walk into this. Show me the way to do this. Give me wisdom as I speak. Guide me uh, through this. It says we felt like grasshoppers. And then it says they made the assumption that the other people in the land thought they were grasshoppers too, but it never said that. We have a noisy grasshopper in the room, I think. Um, (laughs) They imposed their own self-doubt on what others thought, and as a result, they totally limited their ability. They were no longer able to do the things that God wanted them to do because they imposed this self-doubt on themselves. And by the way, they paid for this lack of faith by wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Church, don't limit what God wants to do in you or through you or, or with you because of your assumptions of what your capacity is about. Recognize that if he calls you salt and light, Sorry, 
I got to get back to this. Recognize that it, I really do think there is a place in the foyer that that child would be much more comfortable right now, and so would everybody else. So forgive me if that is embarrassing, but I think we need to do that at this time. So God wants you to do things, and he has the, the direction for you, but if you allow your ability to be limited on the basis of things that you see in yourself, you're going to be limited. And so are we going to limit what God wants to do in and through us? I, I got to say, we, sh- we shouldn't. Invite him into the mix. You'll be surprised what he could accomplish with you. And by the way, God was ready to go with him. He was ready to do it. He was ready to win the battle for him. He never asked for their opinion on whether it could be done. His first instruction to Moses was this. Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I'm giving to the Israelites. He was, it was a done deal in his mind. It was the land he was giving to the Israelites. And they limited themselves. So the question is this. How do you see yourself? Do you shut down things that God wants to do? Do you, do you limit the, the capacity that he has for you on the basis of what you see from your past? Don't, don't let that, that happen. So here, let me give you another example. This is a very different example, but it's where Samuel goes to the house of Jesse and he's looking for a new king. And it's one of those areas where, again, uh, he, can be, um, he can be, by looking at things from a human perspective, he can miss the point. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, Fill your flask with olive oil. Go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. He says, take a heifer. The Lord says, take a heifer and say that you've come to make a sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And then I'll show you which of his sons you're supposed to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons, and he invited them to the sacrifice too. And when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? And there are still the youngest, Jesse replies, but he's out in the field, he's watching the sheep and goats. Well, send for him at once, Samuel said, and we're not going to sit down and eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent out for him, and when he came in, He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes, and the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. By the way, not because he was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. (laughs) So David stood there among his brothers, and Samuel took the flask of olive oil that he had brought, uh, and he anointed David with the oil, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David on that day. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. So it's interesting that even Samuel makes the wrong assumption when he started to meet the sons. Samuel wasn't looking for the right thing either. The man of God had it wrong in what his approach was. And I, I got to say, I do kind of wonder why God didn't say, hey, go and anoint the youngest son of Jesse. You know, why did he have to go through the process on that? But I think there was something that God was working out in Samuel as well, helping him to understand what was really the criteria, what was, was uh, really the goal. And so he first starts with the oldest. He begins to work his way down. God rejects them all. Harsh wording, by the way. But the criteria that was used was inconsistent with God's ways. Good looking, strong, a a, a leader. And Jesse didn't even present uh, uh, David. In fact, it says that he went through the seven sons. But what about David? Didn't even consider him a son? Was he not worthy of that. He was the errand boy. He was the sheep farmer, but he was the responsible one, and he was the one God had chosen. So sometimes other people may eliminate us from the mix. You may have family that would even eliminate you from the mix. His own family dismissed him. His brothers looked down on him, and Samuel was imposing human methods to determine God's chosen king. Church, do not employ human methods to accomplish spiritual matters. Do not employ human methods to accomplish spiritual matters. Say that to someone next to you. The key line in this is verse 7. 
Verse 7 says, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected them, him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Say it again. He looks at the heart. God is looking for our heart. He's not looking at whether your pre-Christian days were a disaster. He's not looking at whether or not you're still stumbling or struggling through things. He's looking at your heart. Are you moving toward him? Are you, are you drawing toward him? Are you growing in him? That's what God wants uh, from us. So work on your heart. Make sure your heart is in tune with God. Spend time with him. Uh, you'll be totally surprised what he has for you. So we can't talk about this subject of, um, of people maybe eliminating themselves or maybe not being qualified for something without talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. I mean, she's a perfect example of that. Luke chapter 1, if you take a look at that. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a village in Galilee to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of the king, David. Uh, Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, which, by the way, that is the line that angels always have when they come because I think they're scary. Don't be afraid. Angels, clowns, scary things. But, uh, I, you know, I think, I think that when we read this, we don't realize, I think angels are probably ominous beings. They're, they're, they're large, and, and, uh, and so here's Mary, you know, all of a sudden there's an angel in her room. Don't be afraid, Mary. He says, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And Mary asks the angel, but how? How can this happen? I'm a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And Mary responded, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything that you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. The angel tells Mary that she's pregnant, but she is acutely aware of her own limitations that would keep that from happening. She's too young. She's not married. She, uh, she's a virgin. It's not in her plans. Uh, this is not something that she's ready for. And the angel assures her this, that she has found favor with God. She has found favor with God. Church, regardless of anything else, the key is important. More, more important than understanding your limitations is understanding whether or not you've found favor with God. And tell the person next to you, say, you found favor with God. God sees us through the lens of what Jesus Christ has accomplished. And as a result of that, you and I are covered with the forgiving blood of Jesus, the grace that, uh, that comes over our life. And as a result, we're, we can be his favored sons or daughters. And as we pursue the plans that God has for us, he makes us whole. He's always with us. He makes us victorious. But we still limit ourselves. Can I tell you a personal story? This one isn't from Scripture, but let me tell you a personal story. Um, this is a personal experience. I, I, about two years ago when Chris and I came to the church, I mentioned that I would tell this at some point. I actually only told it to a couple of small groups, uh, uh, smaller groups of people. So to some people, this might seem like a rerun. Uh, and if, if it does... Uh, I apologize for that, but uh, I, want, I wanted everyone to hear this. In 1984, a long time ago, it's 40 years ago, um, I was on the facilities crew here at the church. We were called green shirts. Anybody have any idea why we were called green shirts? Because we wore green shirts. Thank you. It, it wasn't really, <laughs> wasn't a trick question. But I was in school full time, and uh, I was going to night school, and I was studying for ministry, and I worked full time. From 6 uh, a.m. till 2.30 every day, uh, I, I worked at cleaning the church. And I, I served in the youth group, helping out the high school students three times a week. We did Sunday morning and Wednesday night and one other time uh, uh, during the week. And so I, w I was busy uh, not only preparing but also working so that I could prepare. And, 
and uh, pay for that. And, and so one day our crew was taking a break. We we're actually in this back corner right here behind where our, our sound booth is. The sound booth wasn't there at the time. And um, I, I was back there and we were taking a break. It was 9.30 in the morning. We'd come in at 6. And so we're getting a 15-minute a break now. And we're all kind of laying on the floor of the sanctuary because several of us were going, going to school from 6 to 10 at night and then coming home and going to bed and then coming back to work in the morning. And so as we're all laying on the floor back there, one of the pastors comes walking through, and he comes walking through those doors, and, and he, he walks all the way down that, that all is going to go out this uh, back door here, and he stops, and he comes back, and he says, hey, Doug, I want to talk to you, and I thought, great, I'm in trouble, uh, because that's the way my mind always thinks, and, um, and so he said, uh, can you come here, and I, I want to share something with you, and so we went aside where nobody else could hear us, and he said, um, Last night, I had a dream, and you were in it, and I was walking just like I was walking right now through the sanctuary, but you were on this platform preaching, and you were the pastor of the church. And I, I admit, I, I laughed, uh, and I, I laughed slightly because I was a youth pastor. I was a janitor. I had just finished cleaning like 58 toilets in this building, and, uh, and now you're telling me that you saw a picture of me preaching, and I was the pastor of the church. And so later that afternoon... Um, I'd gone home, I'd gotten cleaned up, and I was uh, getting ready to go back to school, and I stopped over at Krista's house. We'd started dating a few months before that, and uh, so I was in the kitchen talking to her and her mom, and I was telling the story, and as I was telling the story to them in the kitchen, her dad comes walking through, and he hears me telling this story right at the point where I said, you know, uh, and he said that uh, you were preaching on the platform and that you were going to be a, uh, the pastor of the church, and and um, I, I said I laughed, and her dad walks through and goes up to his office, and maybe it would be good to just kind of explain. Krista's dad was Jack Hayford, and Pastor Jack, of course, had been the founding pastor of this church uh, for you know years. He served here and continued to minister here until just a, a few years before his uh, passing, which was about 18 months ago. And not only that, I mean, he was kind of a he was kind of a, a, a big deal, uh, you know, in the Federation sort of thing. He was a, he was a, um, he was a, uh, a, a big name in Christianity for decades. He had, uh, had served the Lord and people knew him, you know, like 60 decades or something. Well, six decades, 60 years. <laughs> he was like as old as Yoda. And he kind of was like the Yoda of the kingdom, you know. And, uh, and he, he was a little scary. And uh, we loved him. We did, uh, like you love Yoda as well. Um, he, he was an awesome man. And so he walks through the kitchen, goes up to his office, and comes back like a minute later and comes walking into the kitchen and points his finger at me, says, don't laugh at that. You have no idea what God's plans may be. Then he walked away. Uh, and... <laughs> And a dozen years later, I thought about that as I was preaching on this platform for the first time, because I remember, you know, that happened about 12 years uh, after that. And uh, the Lord reminded me, he said, you have no idea what my plans might be. And that dream came back to my mind two and a half years ago. I, I've, you know, thought about it numbers of times along the way, because it's been kind of a shaping thing. But two and a half years ago, when pastors Tim and Deborah contacted Chris and me and asked if we'd come back and share the lead pastor role with them, that dream came back again because the Lord says, you have no idea what my plans may be. What are the plans God may have for you? What are the things that, that we may laugh at thinking, how could that ever happen? See, here's the point of that story. I was dangerously close to dismissing God's plans that he showed me decades before because I couldn't see me the way he saw me. And God sees things different. And it's an honor to serve here and do what God told me to do 40 years ago. But I do have to say, it's an amazing thing to think that in 1984, God knows the plans of what he wants to do in the 2020s. And today, God knows the things that he wants to do in you 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And make the decision now that you'll let those things be worked out so that they uh, work right. There may be tests you're walking through right now. Or you might see the limitations or the difficulties or the, the bumps and bruises. Just remember God loves you and he has your best interest in mind. And he sees a whole different view of you than you see of yourself. Church, it's so easy to limit God. It's so easy to listen to the wrong person's opinion. 
It's so easy to see things from the wrong perspective, and it's too easy to miss God's plans in our life because of it. So my question is this. Do you see yourself as the warrior that God sees you as, or are you still the grasshopper that you see in your own eyes? Because God has a plan for you to take territory for him. And sometimes we limit ourselves on the basis of seeing ourselves as a grasshopper. Do you see yourself as the king that God intends you to be? Or are you still limited by the fact that you're a, a sheep herder? And you say, that's all I can see of myself. I don't know how to move beyond that. Or do you see yourself as the favored servant God says you are? Or can you not imagine God working through a normal boy or girl or man or woman like you? And yet God has plans for incredible things that he wants to birth inside of you, wants to birth through you. Amazing things that he wants to do and our perceptions have the ability to limit us. Or we can listen to what God says and we can be released from those things in our past and be allowed to be a force in his kingdom, salt and light that changes, that influences the environment all around us. And when we limit ourselves, we short circuit so many things in our lives and the lives of those that God intends for you to influence. Because remember, the encounters we have with Jesus are not just for us, they're to help other people encounter Jesus too. So it's also possible to have faith that truly becomes a reality for us, but we inadvertently don't step into everything that God offers to us because we see the limitations. Or it's possible to be a believer in Christ and really let it make just about as much change in us as the gym membership card that you have in your pocket that you haven't gone to for, for months, you know. And there's times that, listen, we're not carrying a membership card that says we're believers. We're, we're, we're saying, Lord, do through us what you need to do through us. Take the initiative for God that God has for you. And as it happens, you draw close to him. You grow in your faith. You begin to serve others. And you'll develop as a leader. So I want to invite us to do the same thing we did last week. We're going to take um, about, we actually have a little more time uh, this service. We're going to take about a minute and just talk to one person next to you. I want you to tell them, what's a thing that you heard today? What's one thing that stands out? What's one thing that maybe you need to take action on? Take about 60 seconds. Do that, and then I want to draw us back and pray. Make sure both of you get a chance to talk. Let me pray for us. Lord, uh, I really thank you for the fact that you see value in each of us and oftentimes value way beyond what we see in ourselves. God, would you move us away from the limitations of what we see in us? And let us become the people that uh, see ourselves the way you see us because of the work, the transforming work that the Holy Spirit has done in our lives. Would you change us and shape us into your image, Lord God? Would you take the broken things in us and make them whole? Would you deliver us from areas where uh, uh, sin may have clouded judgment or caused things to happen in our past, but now we we live under the blood of Jesus and may we, we see ourselves because of your grace upon us rather than those things of a broken past. 
Church, with our eyes closed a second, I just want to ask, maybe there's somebody here. I, 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 I really felt last service, and I feel this here too. Maybe you're here and you'd say, Pastor, there are things in my past that I can't stop thinking about, and they limit me. There are things in my past that I need to be set free from, and maybe you've already been set free, but your mind is continually trapped by that. If that's you, just just raise your hand. Nobody's looking around, but I want to pray for people. Oh, Jesus, would you bring deliverance right now? If there are places where the enemy begins to whisper to us about things and maybe even shout at us about things from our past that hinder us from being what you have for us, I want to break that now in the name of Jesus that that would not continue to exist in our minds or our hearts, but we would start recognizing that your forgiveness transforms us, and because of that forgiveness, we also are set free from shame. Let us walk now, Lord, in in the complete hope of uh, of freedom from, from those broken thoughts of our past, and that, Lord, you don't see us as the person we once were. Lord, I... I'm not a criminal in your mind. I'm not an alcoholic in your mind. I'm not an abandoner in your mind. I'm not whatever it would be. But I am am a, a son or a daughter of the King of Kings that is set free because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And Lord, you see me that way. May I see me that way too. May that be true for all of us, that we would see ourselves the way you see us. And I just proclaim freedom today over every person that raised their hands. In Jesus' name, be free. Amen. I want to ask one more thing. Maybe you're here today and you've never opened your heart to Christ. We're going to keep our eyes closed for a second. Maybe you're here and you'd say, I need to start a relationship with Christ. I need Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And if that's you, I'm going to invite you to uh, raise your hand as well. Nobody else is looking around, but I want to pray with you. If you're here and you're saying, I need Jesus to be Lord of my life, I agree with you. Look up at me if you're raising your hand. I agree with you. Today, Jesus comes to be the Lord of your life. Are there others? I'm just going to look across the room. I see you right there. Today, Jesus comes to be the Lord of your life. Are are there others? Just I I see you right there. Jesus comes to be the Lord of your life. And there's two, three, four, uh, three in a row and one behind you. I agree with you today. Jesus comes to be the Lord of your life. And you too right there. Jesus is coming to be the Lord of your life. I think there's two of you there. Someone back there, I agree. Lord, I pray now for each person. Thank you. Thanks for raising your hand. Thanks for waiting for me to look. I know the Lord's been waiting for you to make that decision. Lord, now for these several that have just made that decision for you, I pray that you would move in with forgiveness for past sins and you would let them now place you on the throne of their heart. You are worthy, Lord, for that position and you are the only one that is worthy. Would you sit on the throne of that heart in Jesus' name? And Lord, let there be blessing now that as they, as they begin to move forward and grow in you, that they would have a, a solid foundation to stand upon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.